Sail official eco take this world film I could see very good at or I never go to open the Good afternoon. We're going to start the press conference of the film in the official section, Take, Take This Waltz. And we have with us the director, Sarah Polly. And she's awaiting, eagerly awaiting our first questions. First question, please. In the middle there. Microphone, please. I liked your film very much. And I thought it was a marvelous film. I feel identified partially with your vision of love and relationships. And I had a couple of questions. One is, I think that your film could be encased in a sort of American independent low budget films that have been emerging of young directors as of late. That's the last few years. And I would like to know whether you were influenced by any film or director or any type of cinema in particular, genre of film, that is to say. Then your family, your, your, to the cinema, because you have relatives that are, or people in your family that are linked to uh, cinema, or is it just a personal, or is it a very personal approach the way you made this film, or is there any influences? Uh, I like the ending, I liked it very much, but the, the film... It can bring about several different types of endings, I believe. Was it clear from the outset when you wrote the script that that was going to be the ending or were several possible alternatives uh, emerged along the way? Or, okay. Um, in terms of uh, influences, I think as an actor, I've, I've worked with a lot of first-time and second-time filmmakers who are constantly referencing other filmmakers during the process of making the film. And that can be somewhat demoralizing. Not that we don't all get influenced by other filmmakers, but just sometimes you feel like you're not helping to create something original when you're constantly looking at what other filmmakers have done. So I've been very conscious in making this film and my last film to not consciously think about other filmmakers or films while I'm working. But of course, subconsciously, I'm very affected by other filmmakers. And um, a lot of filmmakers probably that I've, that I've worked with... Um, in terms of the ending of the film, uh, my original concept for the film was always that it would begin and end w in a domestic scene with her making muffins, so that we would see someone in a very similar state but having experienced a lot in between. And then the ending, you know, having her alone on the scrambler in the dark with the lights and the music, that was always a scene that was supposed to come a lot earlier, and it was actually our assistant editor, Louis, who um, suggested, you know what, this, this has to end the film. And at first we thought he was crazy, and then we did it, and we realized there was there was no other ending for it. Ahí mismo hay una pregunta, ahí al lado, sí. Hi, congratulations for your film. I liked it very much. I would like to ask you whether you, just like the character of the, sis, the alcoholic sister-in-law, would do you think that in life we people have to well conform our, confirm, conform ourselves with that ex existential void that we live sometimes? Or oh, and the second question is: Is it possible to love us one person for the for one's entire life, which is what the protagonist of the film tries to do, but she doesn't manage to achieve it? I, I do actually agree with what you know, even though she's in a drunken state and is not um, making the best decisions in her own life at that moment. I do agree with what Sarah Silverman's character says at the end that, you know, we, life has a gap in it. And I, I do think that it has a gap in it. I do think that there is a feeling of emptiness that's part of the human condition. I think we, if we're very lucky, go through periods in our life where we don't feel that gap as acutely. But um, I also think, uh, certainly at least in Western culture, we have this perception that if we feel something's missing or if we feel that gap, that means something's wrong and it needs to be fixed and filled with another situation. And I think very rarely does that work in the long term. Um, in terms of, I, yeah, I mean, I definitely know people who have loved each other for their whole lives and have had happy marriages for decades. I think it's extraordinarily rare. And I think when it doesn't happen to us, we, we, it's very easy to feel like a failure. So. Hola. Hi. First of all, I want to congratulate the director for your film. I liked it very much. Perhaps it's a bit long because 
I liked it very much, but I've I've had to look at my watch a couple of times while I was watching it because I think it goes on a bit too long, perhaps. <laughs> Go on. Sí, creo creo que la película demuestra que. Yeah, your film does demonstrate that you've got a very clear style um, in make, uh, making films. I was concerned because I thought the film was going to remind me of Isabel Coisette's type of films, and I don't know why, but it's a very personal style, I believe, you have. And, in fact, it reminds me to a film by Stanley Donnell, which is called Two on the Road, I think, than any other film by uh, Coisette. Mm, sort of Audrey, or 1960s Audrey Hepburn or whatever. Okay, I'm going to ask the question now, right? <laughs> and the question is, I think that the film has a fable-type structure. The truth is, I think that nothing is what you see on the screen, really. I think that she's in a crisis in her relationship, and she invents the other story. And I think that works quite well, because everyone's expecting that they kiss each other, but... But that no, they never get to kiss each other, uh, and a time, and it takes. And what I'm trying to say, that is to say, that opinion, uh, the ending of the film corresponds to reality, it, because this could be the case because you want to do one thing, but I've seen something else. I don't know whether that was a question or not. Yeah, in terms of of, of Isabel, I guess I'll, I'll address that part of the question. Um, Isabel's obviously been a huge influence on me. Um, not only because as, a, as an actress, you work with very few female filmmakers. There are very few examples and very few role models of female filmmakers. So, um, so I think working with Isabel really helped me to be able to imagine I could make films as well. And, uh, you know, generally, again, I don't like thinking about other filmmakers or referencing them when I'm working. But, um, but certainly there was one thing from Isabel that I kept in my, in my mind during this film, which was she's very uh, obsessed with being in the moment and being, as much as she has a very clear vision of what she wants, she's very spontaneous and she wants to make sure she's aware of what's happening in front of her so that she can change her plans accordingly. And I think on my first film, I was much more rigorous and disciplined and controlling of wanting to everything to go as planned. And I think with this film, I let go a little bit and tried to be more playful and tried to discover things a little bit more. Hi, good morning. The truth is, I didn't understand the film. It didn't really fill me, but congratulations, nevertheless. Just by making a film, you've got to congratulate people just by making a f for making a film anyway. I would like you to explain... What, you, what message you were trying to transmit or to convey to the audience or to other audiences in other places? Um, I don't really like it when films have a message, per se, or they have something they want to teach me or an answer. So I think instead I went about this film with a lot of questions and questions I'd heard a lot of people talk about, questions that I think are hard to ask and have conversations about, about long-term relationships and what they do to passion and to sex and... Um, and what we're looking for in long-term relationships in terms of what, what need and what void we want them to fill for us. So um, I more just wanted to raise those questions than provide an answer. I mean, I think people have very, very different responses to this film. I think the characters, um, I've talked to people who think the film is completely sympathetic to the female character. I've met people who think that the, the film is totally told with sympathy to the husband and they really judge the other character, and they feel that, that the film supports their point of view. I think that, in fact, people are projecting their own relationships onto the film, which was ultimately my hope for it. More than a message, I wanted people to project their relationship histories onto it and, and examine it, because, in fact, the film doesn't have a strong point of view in terms of who the character is that the audience is supposed to empathize with. I just find that people's responses really vary, sometimes according to gender, and sometimes according to their relationship history. Hi. Congratulations for the film. I wanted to ask two questions. One, the music uh, that you selected, which I thought which was quite characteristic of independent films, and 
And I would like to know whether, do you believe in coincidences because it starts with a coincident, well, just a, a coincidence and it turns out that they're neighbors and these coincidences are really great because uh, things are going to have, they're going to have a great time, get together and, and then all of a sudden things don't turn out the way we thought they were going to. Th- and I would like to ask you about that, about the coincidences. I mean, I think what's interesting is um, coincidences that have happened in my real life are far, far more extraordinary than coincidences I see in films. When we see them in films, they seem totally unbelievable. But if we're to look at our own lives and the kinds of coincidences that have happened or where you run into someone and run into them again or um, things that line up and have parallels, I think coincidence plays a much stronger and more believable role in our lives than it does in film. So. Y lo de la selección musical. And the music selection, the score. I think a, a lot of it is uh, contemporary, independent Canadian music. So I really wanted to create a sense of the environment that that couple was living in. And, you know, that area of Toronto, there's a lot of amazing music happening, a lot of musicians. So I wanted it to really feel like Toronto now. Hola, buenos días. Yo tenía... Hi, good morning. I had a couple of questions. The first, as regards to the title, I'm not too sure, apart from the, the song that accompanies one of the main scenes, the title wants to symbolize something with a waltz uh, spinning around. you have any ideas as regards to this? And secondly, the film talks about things that may have occurred to us in our day-to-day. Like when you see a, a lightning bolt that hits the other the pavement, it makes you want to cry. I'm not too sure whether that was your own experience or someone in, in your surrounding area. Where are the all of these truths that you want to tell in the film, where do they stem from? Your own real-life situation or... In terms of the title, I was listening to the song Take This Waltz a lot while I was writing it and there's something about that song that I wanted to inform the tone and the character of the film um, and uh, without it being too literal what the connection is, I think. Um, and in terms of... I, no, I mean, it's not, it's not based on me or my life specifically, but I think that that feeling of emptiness or that feeling of us feeling there's something not quite right... Um, was something I want to capture. I think she talks about it in a few ways of not liking being in between things, of um, feeling like she wants to cry and she doesn't know why. And I, I do think we do a lot of attaching reasons to things. And sometimes I think those feelings are just natural and don't necessarily have a, have a reason. Yeah, hi. I want to know something about the soundtrack, but you basically um, answered that uh, I also want to know something about the wheelchair. Why, why is the character a partly handicapped person? What happens, and then what happens to the wheelchair? Why does it appear only in the beginning? And then why, what, what happened to that aspect of the character's she, she, personality? She's lying. <laughs> she's lying because she's afraid. She talks about being afraid of being in between things and the idea that she won't make it where she's going. So I think her neuroses comes out in airports and this feeling that she's going to somehow get lost. Further questions? Yes, at the back there. They hadn't asked this question because I was just in the 12 o'clock screen of the film. About the casting of Michelle Williams for the lead, um, had you seen her performance in Blue Valentine? Because it's a very similar sort of performance of uh, marital fatigue. Or was it a choice? Was your first choice for the lead of the, of the film? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I struggled for a long time with who to cast in that part. And when I met Michelle, for me, there was no one else who, um, who could play the part except her. I actually think, you know, while the subject of it be about a marriage, you know, I can see that comparison with Blue Valentine. I actually think her performance is very different in this film. I think that this character has got more of a sense of humor about herself and uh, she's more self-deprecating and capable of moments of, uh, you know, I think in this character she has more joy and more playfulness than necessarily in that film. I think it's a much more intense film and a much more intense role. I mean, in Blue Valentine, I mean. Further questions, please. There seems to be one at the back. Hi. My question, in the dressing room scene uh, where the 
the, all the women come are, are naked. It's a scene that's not seen too much in North American films, albeit it's an independent film. How did you address uh, shooting the scene? Did you, did you think someone could react in a negative way or in a positive way or in a different way? It's funny because, you know, in, in North America, like, that scene has created such shock. And it's hard to explain to people that it's only in North America where we don't show nudity in a everyday way. I mean, it's like, I think that it's much more unusual in a North American film for some reason to show nudity in a way that isn't overtly sexual or a joke. Um, so I guess uh, I wanted to show nudity in a, and women together in an environment where they were naked, where there wasn't a male eye. And there wasn't that sense of either being, you know, performing or it being sexy or particularly pretty. And it also wasn't played for comic value. There was something kind of commonplace and ordinary about it. You know. Any further questions? Yes, in the front row, quite quickly. Hi, again. Seeing the film in the scene when she asks him what we, he would uh, what he would what he would do and she describes everything it's like harry met when harry met sally something like that whether it's my stupid impression of my mind or i had that in mind and also it reminded me of you and me by leo macari to you when he says we'll see each other oh, when they see you and they say well, i'll see you in the empire state building in 40 years time and you say well 40 years at this lighthouse and it reminded me of that i'm not too sure whether that's my impression or not uh, whether there's any uh, nod towards that sort of there's no, there's no uh, connection i don't think but yeah. <laughs> i can see what you mean yeah <laughs> Sarah Silverman in the film, uh, she, Sarah Silverman in the film, she is totally different as we have already used her. Um, and uh, she has, for example, two lines that if she could uh, use them for a stand-up, it would be funny. But in your film, they seem very sad. The one is the, when she says that uh, she doesn't have a reason to shave her leg. And the other one is uh, when she says that uh, she, will, she is so beautiful that she would like to fuck herself. Mm -hmm. uh, so how difficult was finding out that she has also that kind of tragedy on her? And do you think that comedy connects with drama at the same time? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I always feel like Sarah Silverman has a, an incredibly sharp intelligence to her work. I mean, it's very easy to look at her comedy and think, if you see it on the surface value, it's just hysterical and shocking and funny. But I think she actually has a very sharp political analysis around what she does. I, I saw an interview with her once where she says she was defending herself against charges of being racist because she was playing a racist. And she said, you know, the character I play in my stand-up is someone who's very ignorant and very arrogant and that's something I see a lot of in my country and so I think behind everything she does is a real intent and a real intelligence and I think knowing that as a fan of hers I, I knew that it would be easy for her to do a dramatic role because she has so much depth and she does have an authenticity in the work she's done already so um, I was just really excited as a fan of hers to see her do um, a dramatic role and really I mean it's funny, like, with Seth Rogen and her, I've had the question of a lot is, you know, how did you get such good dramatic performances out of them, which is what you ask about children, usually. And I think that people, even though we've had so many examples of great comedic actors give great dramatic performances, we still get surprised. For me, the biggest shock would be if a great dramatic actor could all of a sudden do comedy. I think that's much more difficult than going from comedy to, from comedy to drama. Nice to see you again, by the way. <laughs> Bien, ¿alguna más, por favor? Any further questions? ¿Ninguna más? Sí. Yes, it seems another one. Hi. I would like to ask you, what's drawn my, drew my attention is that the scene when the song uh, that, that gives the title to the film, two trio scenes appear, uh, threesomes, and it breaks the idea of the romantic, uh, ideal romantic couple, and it's just, and that drew my attention, and I wanted to ask you why you included those trio scenes. I, I thought it was important to show in that, in that sequence the breaking off of all habits. So the idea of she's away from a marriage, and it's full of newness and experimentation and maybe things she's always thought about but never done, and it's this idea of breaking out of all of the 
um, all of the things that a marriage may be inhibited in her and, and all about newness so that by the time we get to the end of that montage and it's old again, that there's been a sense that she's exhausted all the newness in every possible way. Bien, una última pregunta. ¿Alguien se anima? Any further questions? No, if such isn't the case, thank you very much.